Hello beautiful, welcome back to my channel. My name is Tracy and today I wanted to discuss with you the books that I listened to and read in the month of September. I was able to listen to a total of seven and I read two physical books all from the Nashville Public Library. But before we get started, I do want to show you uh, some bookmarks and some stickers that I picked up the other day from the seasonal pages. This is absolutely not sponsored or anything. I don't have a code or anything. Um, I was watching the YouTube, the booktube channel, uh, Mika August, and she talked about this uh, bookmarks. And it was so neat because the one that Mika picked up is the one that I'm gonna show you that has the girl on it, which is actually a wood mark. It's a bookmark made with the thinnest piece of wood you've ever seen. And it feels like that the image was painted on. So it's so neat. And I just wanted to show it to you i'm going to link the seasonal pages and i'm going to link everything i got specifically i'm also going to link mika august the youtube channel as well as her code her um influencer code that i used uh, to pick the uh, bookmarks up as well as far as how I do these book reviews, I always start off with the self-help genre, where there be spirituality or just straight up self-help. Um, and this month was self-help. I listened to four women this month, and they were all very vulnerable and very open. And those are my favorite types of YouTubers to watch, <laughs> books to read, just people to follow who are just kind of raw and honest and let you see their good as well as their bad. Not, you know, for anything other than to let you know that life just is not always uh, rainbows and filters. <laughs> so the first book this month was Big Magic by Elizabeth Gil Gilbert. Um, she's the same author of Eat, Pray, Love, and it's really interesting that um, right when I decided to choose this book, I had just finished Eat, Pray, Love, and I, at the time, I actually didn't realize that it was the same author until I got through the book and she was talking about it. I was like, oh yeah, that's her, because I've never actually read Eat, Pray, Love. I've only watched it, but anyway, Big Magic, from my understanding, what I got of the book is kind of what I was talking about on Instagram the other day. I don't know if you follow me on my second Instagram, but I was talking about how the definition of success and how people always think it's the big gestures or the uh, the new the new house, the new car, and the new things that go on. But for me personally, the success came from when I started loving myself as a person and then I started loving other people. And that is truly the greatest success that I've personally had to date. And one of the things that was interesting about this book is she kind of just talked about that pretty much the definition of what defines big magic are those little things that you do in your day that really change your life. It really changes the crux and it changes the very depths of who you are. That's really the big magic of life. Two stories that stand out to me. One, and she was talking about when she was a little girl, how she was afraid of everything. And she talked about being cripply afraid of everything. And I related to that so much on a personal level. So many stories of my childhood <laughs> popped in my head while she was talking about being afraid. She talked about how when they went on a family vacation to a beach, how she just wanted everyone to come out of the ocean. She didn't want anyone to be in the ocean. She just wanted everybody to be on land and be safe and how she, it just terrified her that people were in the ocean. And she talked about having the right mother, how her mother was like, oh, you're afraid of the ocean? Okay, you're going to get yourself in that ocean. <laughs> and so she was like, her mom made her go in the ocean. She was afraid when the telephone rang all the time. Her mom was like, oh, you're afraid of the telephone? Okay, you're going to answer the telephone every single time it rings. You are the official telephone answerer for the family. And how her mom was like, oh, no, we're not going to live like that. We are not going to be afraid of everything, girl. Mm -mm. And so those little things and her stepping out of those little things really created big magic for her uh, like I said I thought a lot about my childhood and about how even at the age that I am now how I see myself breaking those 
links you know I, there are some chains that have been broken but there are some chains that are still intact but i am loosening those links every day and whenever i do you guys i feel so incredible i feel so strong it puts the biggest smile on my face because those are getting me so much closer to my goal is getting me so much closer to physically breaking that chain whether it be a mental chain or a physical chain that i need to break and those those are the big magic moments for me even in my life so i that resonated with me so much when she was talking about that the second story that stood out actually i'm thinking of another story but i might i may share that with you but the second story that um really stood out to me she was talking about this lady who i think the lady turned 50 and she was just kind of like not satisfied with her life and she just wanted to kind of you know change some things make some things different and she was the she brain dumped and realized that she was super happy when she was figure skating when she was ice skating and so she decided that she would take up ice skating again um she just got a trainer she didn't try to get an olympic coach she just got herself a trainer she would get up early a couple of days a week and she would go ice skating and how that transformed her life and it made big magic grow like i said before people think it's always the grand things that people see of you that's the big magic but her just deciding to do what she loves on a weekly basis was something that was so big and how it just kind of trickled out and manifest it just kind of trickled out and just gave her this life that she had lost and she had forgotten about and sometimes those that's just what you need to do it's not it's those little things like more than just making it is by the happy homemaker am i saying that right i don't know i'll put the you know i'll always put the title of the, the picture of the book of the screen um it's by aaron odom i never heard of aaron odom or her website until i picked this book up and apparently this is like a really well-known website wow wow aaron is is a young caucasian american female and the reason i'm bringing it up specifically is because she kind of talks about it in the book of how she grew up um very religious in the church and the book actually starts off with her and her husband on a missionary trip during the missionary trip her husband revealed something to her so they decide to go to the people who are kind of running the missionary and tell them what's going on and tell them what the husband has just revealed to her and they suggest that they leave that they go back to the united states go back home and kind of work on themselves work on this situation together from my understanding um, I should have put this at the front of the, uh, this video. I've been on an anesthesia since I read some of these books, so my thinking is a little foggy. <laughs> my memory is a little foggy of some of these things. But anyway, um, I don't remember her saying what the husband revealed to her and that they were asked to leave. I mean, or they all made the decision that they should leave. <sighs> this book was a little confusing to me, even just at the title. Because I couldn't understand why more than just making it with an empty cupboard was there. Um, but it also had, it felt like from looking at the title that there was something about finances. So I was just a little bit confused, especially when she kind of started the book off being like on a missionary trip. But man, I got the picture really clearly, really quickly because it really is about budgeting. It really is a financial book about how you can live the life you want and more than just make it this book also resonated with me because you guys know that i have been following financial peace university by dave ramsey for a couple of years now and how um i really did have the opportunity to pay down my debt and um, change the way i lived my life and that i now work 30 hours a week um this book was so vulnerable 
she talked about the first time she ever had to go into the food stamp office and she related it to when she was a young girl and how they would kind of do food pantries or kind of do like drives to help the less fortunate people in her neighborhood uh, in their community and how she never really truly embraced it and how she was even kind of snobby about it looking back at it as an adult she realized how she was really kind of snobby about it there's one story that stuck out to me where she and her husband were you guys they were they didn't have no money and they had a child at the time and I think she may have been pregnant with their second child this particular story like I said I don't remember everything but another friend across town and she I think she gave the amount of miles that the lady lived away she called her husband at work and said this lady invited me on a play date like just i want to say maybe three to between three and nine miles i know that's a big stretch but i just honestly can't remember how many miles but it just was not a lot of miles right and her husband said well can you go next week and when she said that i thought why is she calling her husband to to go on a play date and ain't saying that something to stay at home moms just do like stay, you know what I'm, you know what i'm saying she knew that she had got in that car and gone on that play date the, they would not have had enough gas for the week for her husband to get to work, y'all. A sister can relate, okay? I can relate to not want to go nowhere because, girl, listen, this gas right here got to last me two whole week. We're going to go to the job. We're going to make this money. And we'll come back to this house, and we're going to sit here. <laughs> Yo, it's rare that people actually say that, Right? So for her to say that and how she felt to call that lady and say that they would just have to have the play date another week and that they would try to remember that she was going to that play date and put it in a budget. Y'all, this woman, her husband, she was on food stamp welfare and she had the like the state Medicaid for her and her children. And she could have gone to work and you know, this is interesting. She could have gone to work and given her entire, what she was able to make, give the entire thing to daycare. I understand not wanting to do that, even as a person who's never had children. I understand not wanting to do that, especially into relationship to she's knowing that she's about to have another child and have to be on maternity leave. I understand. I understand what it must be like to be a mom and make those decisions, even though I'm not a mom. I've never had to make those decisions. I don't think that anyone can say she's right or wrong. I think you have to do that in your situation. And I'm thinking about someone that I'm really close to in my life who chooses to work a certain way so that she's able to take care of her daughter better. And I know for a fact my mom did the same thing for me. My mom had very specific jobs where she would be home when from after school. She would be the one to pick me up from school and take me home and spend the evening with me. Now, that means she had to be at work at butt crack of dawn and I had to go to before care, whether it would be a friend of the family, someone we went to church with, or some sort of school before care. But after work, it was highly important to her to be home with me and the one to take care of me after work. I just don't think anybody can say what a mom should do. I just don't think they can. I think that's... I personally think that's off limits. And so I found it really interesting how she kind of felt like she had to rationalize that to other people. And I'll be honest, I haven't always felt this way. I've always been confused. I'm like, well, if you need money, why you ain't going to work? But it's it's not always just that linear. It's, it, there are some variables to it usually. And I love the way she just decided how she was finally figured out what they needed to do to make their life work. It was really interesting because 
she talked about everyone that she kind of talked to about her finances or showed their finances to they all said the same thing you guys don't have an income you guys don't have a spending problem you guys have an income problem once again i related to that i've talked about the story of my kind of financial partner that i used uh his name is travis and the first time he looked at my very first dave ramsey budget he was like you have to make more money like you have to <laughs> So I can relate to that as well. I did go out and get a second job, but she chose to do things very differently because I was a single person and she did things very differently. And they, uh, she talks about so many things in this book, you guys. She talks about so many resources that I didn't even think of, that I didn't even know existed. She talked about even housing contracts, like she and her, husband had bought a house in another city they had lived there before they went on their missionary trip but after their missionary while they were gone they rented it out so because they needs to be close to their parents they kept renting it out for years and then so one day they finally decided that they were going to sell this house and in the contract in their contract from the bank they were not allowed to use this house as a rental property, but they didn't know that they had not read that in their banking contract. So when it came time for them to sell the house, they they couldn't, I think because as far as the bank was concerned, they were in breach of contract or something like that. So it ended up being where they had to file bankruptcy, you guys. And she talked about that, which I've done as well. She talked about that. Y'all, she talks about some stuff in this book. I feel like if you're having a hard time grasping what or why you should be budgeting to live a better life, I understand why people can't relate to Dave Ramsey. I totally, 1,000% understand why they can't relate to him. They can't re relate to his daughter because she's his daughter. <laughs> um, and I understand sometimes that even if you can't relate to me because I am single, you guys, this book was so, so good. I think that this is probably the most important book that I listened to in the month of September. And it is 100% worth the listen or read if this is something that is you've been mulling over in your own life. No matter what, Nine Steps to Live in the Life You Love is by Lisa Nichols. The very first time I ever saw Lisa Nichols was on the documentary, The Secret. I had been watching The Secret and it was all making sense to me. The wheels were, things were clicking in my head while I was watching it. But it wasn't until she got, came on the screen that I began to believe for me. You know what I mean? Like you can look at something and be like, yeah, that's the bomb. Like, yes, 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 dude, uh -huh, that makes sense. But then there's a part of you that still doesn't believe that this is something that you can do. Well, that's how I felt watching the documentary Secret until Lisa Nichols' face popped up on the screen. And I remember being so moved by her specifically because she was talking about love. And I've talked to you guys before about how important it was for me to love, to learn love, to love myself and to love other people. That is something that has been, that I have been asking God for, for so many years. I just, even more than money, if I just wanted to love, I wanted to learn love. And so that's what she was talking about. And because she was somebody that I could relate to, I remember feeling so differently to the point that the next day I looked up her website and I sent her an email and this was back way before Instagram this was back before Facebook so people had websites <laughs> so I would look up their website and uh, was able to email her through that and she responded which of course threw me over the moon and it's probably why I was so focused on love because I had a thought process of what love should be based on the scriptures and based on other people that I saw not based on my own life and understanding but what I saw it just felt like I was missing something out on that and I spent so many years and I feel today sitting here differently so I feel I almost fulfilled where it comes from love but I've done so much work about it and so one of the things that I love about this book so much is that 
Lisa Nichols, everything I've ever seen her in write or talk about, she's always so vulnerable and she's always so open about what's going on. So there's a couple of things that stand out for me in this book. There's two stories I'll talk to you about. The first one is about when she was ready to find a job and she went, uh, she was calling different companies to ask them, will I get a computer that I can take home with this job? Do I get to dress <laughs> a certain way on this job? And will I get to travel? And if they said no to those questions, then she just moved on. And I thought that was so powerful because I know for me, I do have this thought process where I should take what I can get. And even though she was going through a very hard time in her life, she was like, no, I'm not doing that. She just had enough about herself to know that she could have exactly what she wanted. And that's something that I'm learning to do and take for the rest of my life since I'm learning it a little late. But anyway, I love that about her. She finally called a company who answered yes to all three of her questions. And she was like, okay, well, can I come in? The lady that was on the phone was so impressed was like, by the time Lisa showed up, she knew that she was going to hire her. It was just a matter of meeting her. <laughs> so they hired her and she ended up having great success in the job. And the job actually definitely uh, matched up with her personal goals. The second story I want to talk about was truly interesting too, which I actually heard her talk about before, but I don't remember it being in such great detail as what she put in this book. She talked about being engaged and how things were going so well and they had moved in together. She always kind of felt a little something, but she ignored that intuition which is God talking to you, by the way. <laughs> she was always ignoring that. And so she um, decided that she was going to go ahead and move through with the relationship. And one day that everything was going well, she had her son by this time as well. This is not her son's father. And, you know, things are going so well. And she gets this vision of being choked to death, like someone's trying to kill her. And she was like, which well, that's not right. That's nowhere near what's going on in my life right now, whatever, and all that. And so that particular night, he ended up trying to kill her. She talked about how long it took her, how many times he tried to kill her again, how unsafe she felt, how un uneasy she felt, how she never knew when he was going to go off, and how she ended up calling his family was like, yo, hey, what's, what's up with dude? Like, what's up? And they didn't want to tell her because they didn't want to make him mad, which I think is real shitty. They knew this man had mental health issues and then to want to tell her, I thought that was really shitty. So anyway, um, she ended up having to finally figure out a way to get rid of him and she did and she just kind of when it ended that relationship she just kind of moved on she didn't give herself time to process it she didn't go seek help she didn't get counseling she was lisa nichols she was the one who counseled people she's the one who was the motivational speaker out helping people change their lives and so um, it wasn't until she was doing a workshop with a friend and they were in a group of teenage girls and they were talking about pretty much kind of forgiveness and that relationship where her fiance just started coming up and in the moment sitting there with all of those girls in person, even though she's the one who's supposed to teach in this class, she goes through the exercises and she has to process the fact that she hasn't really let that part of her relationship go with him and she had to really get in touch with and really deal with those demons that she was dealing with and she also talked about her weight in this book she talks about so many things my favorite favorite thing about this book is something that is what keeps me going here on youtube um what keeps me going on here on YouTube now that I've started openly sharing my life with you guys, because I, I didn't always do that. I didn't always do that. Um, and I don't think you have to, I, I don't think you have to openly share your life with people. If you want to be on to, you can totally do that, but I need to, it's something that I, I need to share the truth, my truths with YouTube, with you guys. Um, one thing that, keeps me going is that I'm not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. Even when it comes to my last video where I was talking about having my embolization done, there was just a beautiful comment 
in this comment section saying that she had it too and kind of how it felt so she understood and she wished me well that that was important to me that was very important to me i know i'm not the only one i know i'm not the only but sometimes in your circle you are you are the only one i'm the only one in my circle that's vegan i don't have any friends that are vegan i don't care but i don't so it's nice when I'm able to get inspiration and connect from the internet, from other people sharing their vegan foods and their ideas. Um, I'm the only one that I know that ain't got no hair <laughs> by choice. <laughs> I'm the only one. Well, actually, Cousin Paula recently cut her hair very short, but still not this short where you can see your scalp and walk around real happy and don't care. I'm the only one. Every All of my other friends have huge heads of hair or they have extensions or whatever. Um, it, I, it gets to feeling like you're by yourself and it puts you in a very depressed place and it really makes you want to shrink back and you kind of stop being the best of who you are. Her book, she talks about it in the beginning of her book where everyone, every time she does a seminar, she'll tell people to put your hand up if you have ever been or known someone in this situation. Raise your hand if another thing dealing with the situation now with both hand raised stand up if it's this part of the situation she says she does it when she's in a big space like in one of her seminars so people can visually see they are not alone they're not by themselves and i think that is just the best thing <laughs> i think it's the best thing i know that i feel so much freer when I open up about certain things, I ain't been tell y'all everything because that ain't none of y'all business. But there are certain things that I feel like it's really important for people to know that they're not the only ones. So, 100 Ways to Simplify Your Life by Joyce Myers. I'm going to be real honest with y'all. <laughs> I had my medical procedure done on the 10th. I listened to this book on the 12th. I don't remember a lot. <laughs> I really don't. I was going in and out of sleep while I was listening to this book. But what I can remember <laughs> is she kind of talked about, and I, re I remember out not far after this book, me telling my friend Janine something about her and her children, about Joyce Myers and her children's book. But I honestly cannot remember what I told Janine. I do remember laying there finding great comfort in this book. Um, I remember some of the things she was talking about one thing that caught my attention specifically was the same thing that i learned in stillness is the key is that a lot of times one of the things that keep us unnecessarily busy or too into things it's it's truly minding other people's business like there's an the ego part of you that wants to be first and wants to know first or wants to share the information first. And that's complicated. It's really complicated. It's simple if you just mind your own business is really the best way I could describe it. And it's much more peaceful when you mind your own. But even though it feels hard right here in America with this election coming up, you feel it's hard, but you still kind of have to try to mind your own business. That's one of the, and there's another story for the life of me I can't remember. But I'll be honest with you and tell you that I'm not a Joyce Myers fan. I'm not interested in being preached to at all. That's why I chose this specific book. At the beginning of each one of the ways, because there are 100 ways, a whole 100 of them. Um, she does share a scripture, but she also shares a quote at the same time where a quote, the quote could be from Aristotle or from Churchill or something like that. Um, this was a really good book. I actually do plan on listening to, I actually probably going to try to pick a physical book up from the library to read this again in December to prepare me for January. So, um, yeah, I don't know how to tell you, but I think it's good from what I can remember. Something touched me. I told Janine about it. Maybe Janine will put it in the comment section because I can't remember. <laughs> Let's get into the novels. So I think my favorite type of uh, book is contemporary novels. I'm I'm thinking that's my favorite kind of book. Um, I want to start off with the Reluctant Royals novella. I told you last month when I told you about the Reluctant Royals series where um, it was... Um, a princess by the 
something princess something do by default and a prince on paper those books that i talked to you about last month by Alyssa cole um i told you that they had some 0.5 so there was a 1.5 and a 2.5 or something like that and i listened to both of those this month the first one is once ghosted twice shy and this is about the personal assistant to the king to the prince in the first book so the man in the first book that's the prince this person is his personal assistant you remember i told you that letty in the first book was getting all these emails from the solo and she was just deleting them and everything well this person the main character of this book is the person who was sending her those emails that turned out to be real so when they were in new york to meet letty this personal assistant person got on an app similar to tinder and she ended up just kind of wanting to kick it to meet someone to find someone to kick it with and she ended up meeting this lady and they had a very wonderful time together had a really really good experience but the lady who actually lived in new york was at the time she was at a transition in her life and she really couldn't get into anything serious and then this assistant person lives in africa so she really couldn't do anything that serious either but it turned out they really really liked each other however the person in new york was like listen you're gonna be gone anyway i think we should just end this now and when the girl from africa was sort of like was like wait a minute wait like you just gonna ghost me like we, just, we ain't gonna talk about it and she wouldn't respond to any of her messages so she went back to africa she was sulking she was upset but she you know <laughs> got over it but she decided that when she had some vacation time when the prince actually gave her some vacation time she wanted to go back to new york only because when she was there before she didn't get to do a lot of things that she wanted to do so she ended up saying the girl actually saw her on the train and said something to her and so the girl from africa was kind of like cold and like was really upset like didn't wasn't expecting to see her at all because it's like a billion people in new york and so she wasn't expecting to see her and the fact that she did they kind of ended up spending the day together and they were able to f get everything out that happened and why she ghosted her so even though she explained why she ghosted her of course the girl from africa was still feeling very vulnerable and didn't want to actually get back into the relationship even though t they had really fallen in love with each other in just that short period of time the only reason I didn't like this book is because I, I did, the other books were so seamless in how they matched up. This book felt very disconnected from the series, but on its own, it's a really good book. But it threw me only because, like I said, it just didn't meld into the rest of the stories like they had melded into each other. And so that one felt, this, this just felt a little bit disconnected for me. It turned out that they were um, quite compatible with one another. And one of my favorite things about this series, that I said before, that this is a highly, highly diverse series of characters. It really, really is beautiful. I beautiful love story that two people just connected to one another and it was really really sweet and it ended up that the girl from africa was able to help the girl from new york with her huge problem and which was one of the reasons that she had ghosted her in the beginning so it turned out to be very beautiful like i said it just felt a little bit disconnected from the rest of the series and the reason i'm saying that is because the next book can't escape love was felt way more connected um so the character in the second book duke by default i remember i told you guys that she had a twin sister so the twin sister was the main character of the second book and i told you that the twin sister was in a wheelchair and that she had some kind of condition and that one of the things that she was struggling with is that she was having a hard time falling asleep so when she used to have a hard time falling asleep before there was this guy who would do lives he probably was doing it on what you would consider youtube he would do a live or even twitch and his voice was always so calming to her and would always relax her and put her to sleep 
So after much research, her sister, which is the one, the person that the second book was about, found him and the twin who um, has the physical ail ailments, emailed him and asked him if he would do a recording of her, of his voice so that she could um, start falling asleep. And he was like, what? He was like, mm -mm, I ain't doing it. <laughs> Pretty much. They ended up talking to each other on the phone and they even ended up FaceTiming each other because it turned out that he was um, he was really into puzzles. He was like a puzzler. And one of the puzzles that he was working on was actually an escape room for some anime that this girl was way way into she knew all the characters had seen every season and they were talking on the phone to each other and the girl goes wait a minute there's an ambulance going by so the ambulance go by and then two minutes later on his end the same ambulance go by and they was like wait a minute because the guy's phone number was a california area code but her phone number was a new york area code and she was like, are you in New York? Turned out they were only a few blocks from each other. And so the way this book sums up connected to the second book in the series way better than, um, way better than once Ghosted Twice Shy did. It just, it just felt way more connected to the series than the other book did but like I said on this own the other book was really good but this book was really good too because it tied up one of the things of the second book that I had kind of been wondering about I was like oh he did that he did that so it was really really cool so I enjoyed it too I really like this Alyssa Cole her style of white writing her diversity she has a new thriller out that I'm trying my best not to purchase, but I think I may end up having to purchase it because that library wait is gonna probably be next May before I read it, and I really want to read it. And it's called Oh, I can't no one, no one is watching, something like that. But it looks really good, so I'm really enjoying Alyssa Cole as an the next book I listened to was Such a Fun Age by Keely Reed. So based on the books that I read this year Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell is my favorite book Where the Card Crawdads Seen by Delia Owen was my second favorite book I'm going to bump Delia Owen to three and I'm going to replace it with Such a Fun Age by Keely Reed you guys this is honestly one of the best most relevant most uncomfortable most interesting most lovable most what the hell he say books i've ever ever listened to and i'm so happy i listened to it versus reading it because i don't know if i would have enjoyed enjoyed it as well so the main character in such a fun age is emira emira is a 20 something and it starts off with her at a club with her three girlfriends celebrating one of their birthdays it's really loud in the club and she gets a phone call from the lady that she works for. She has two jobs. She has two jobs. One of them, she's a typist. And one of them, she is a babysitter. So she goes to babysit a couple of days a week from like noon till 7 p.m. And so the babe, the her babysitting job called her late in the evening. And it's like, hey, can you do me a favor and come and take, um, I think the baby, she calls her Bri. Uh, Briar, the little girl's name is Briar. So she's like, can you come take Briar down to the local gro grocery store? Briar likes to go see the nuts and different things at the local grocery store. So she ends up, she's like, I'll pay you, cab her, I'll pay you this, I'll give you this much money, like, can you just please come do it? Well, she's actually not having the greatest time at the club. So she decides to go ahead and do it, and one of her girlfriends decides to go with her. So they go pick up the child, they go to the neighborhood grocery store, and they end up dancing in the aisles to Whitney Houston. And a couple of people walk by and it's kind of smiling at them and everything. And so then the friend ends up having to leave so she and briar decide that they want to go look at what like the nuts i think they were going to briar likes to look at the nuts so they go to look at the nuts but on the way one of the people who had passed them was a white lady oh yeah emira is black the family she works for is white <laughs> 
So there's, and they, the family she works for is in this really upscale neighborhood in Philadelphia. So when they go to this grocery store, it's, a, it's probably like a Whole Foods, uh, probably just a little bit more uppity than a Whole Foods. And so the white lady decides to tell security that this black lady has this little white girl and almost as if they're accusing a mirror, not almost, mm -mm. They're accusing a mirror of some kind of file play. Like she has this child late in the grocery store past her bedtime when she shouldn't be. So security gets involved. It gets physical, but there happens to be a white man named Kelly who is filming the whole thing. He's filming the entire thing because he's like, he knows it's wrong. Security guards have no reason to detain her. Security guard get in her face. They try to take the child from her. So she ends up calling the father. She was like, let me just call her her dad. He's a rich white man. He'll he'll come straight and solve that all out. And he does. Even though all of that happened in the first child for child, that ain't got nothing on what this book about. This book talks about white savior complex. This book also talks about Kelly. Y'all, this book is so good. Please read this book. <laughs> please, please read this book. This book is so good. So Kelly, the guy who's filming everything, ends up seeing, um, he emails the video to Mira because he wants to post it. And she was like, absolutely do not post that video. Absolutely not. Don't post it. Because she's just a person that's really, she doesn't even have like Instagram or anything like she doesn't understand social media. She doesn't even understand anything. She pretty much just emails. Like, she is very content in her life. She's, let me just say, she's not really content in her life, but, because she's trying to find another job because she's about to be 27, so she's not content in her life. But she just doesn't do life the way her circle does. So, Alik is Briar's mother and she's this white lady who has her own business and she's doing very well and she has hundreds and thousands of subscribers and fans to her blog and one of the reasons she hires Amira is because Amira doesn't know who she is and Amira has never heard of her company because everyone else that she uh, interviews to be a nanny all know who she is and just kind of like really want to kind of suck at the teat of this successful uh situation so she doesn't hire them so she hires a mirror that's one of the main reasons she um, hires her and you guys y'all it turns out that a leak her babysit the person that she babysits for and kelly the person who takes this video of her at the store that she ends up dating actually knew each other in high school they found out because they go to Alik's house for Thanksgiving and she brings Kelly with her. But the way they knew each other in high school, y'all. This is the most, this book was so good. I'm not even telling you an inkling. I cannot even begin to tell you how many levels this book has to it. After I finish, whenever a book moves me, when I finish listening to the book, I always try to go find interviews with the author. And I found an interview with Keely Reed, and she was talking to Trevor Noah, who is hysterical, by the way. And so Trevor Noah was talking to her about the book, and Keely Reed said one of the things she loves is uncomfortable stress situations between people. Y'all, there was a point to this book where I was listening to it, and it was the middle of the day. I stopped it because i was like this is making me too uncomfortable this is but this is making me too uncomfortable it's not a horror book it's not hard it's not suspenseful at all but the way she writes these situations you can literally feel the tension in the air i'm not even beginning to tell y'all everything this book it is this book is it's layers to this. It's layers to this, y'all. It's layers to this. This book was so good. If you don't read anything else I talk about in this book, get to know Emira, Alik, and Kelly. Y'all need to know them. Even Bri. I love the way she wrote this little girl in this book. I think Bri is two or three in this book, but Bri has always this huge personality. I understand the relationship of the way Keely wrote bride this little two-year-old character even this little two-year-old character in the book is so important 
she's thinking through things she's reasoning with her things she's smarter than everyone is giving her credit for she knows what's going on this book is so good this is my second favorite book of 2020. i have two physical books that i read this month by the way, everything that I've read, uh, read and listened to, I got from the Nashville Public Library this month. Shout out to Nashville Public Library for helping me make it through this quarantine. <laughs> so I picked these two up. This one is Black Girls Must Die Exhausted, a novel for grown-ups. Um, this is by Jane Allen. When I very first saw the title of this book, I thought, ain't that the damn truth? Listen. <laughs> this is a conversation that I have with my girlfriends all the time, specifically the ones that work in corporate America. Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, Black Girls Must Die Exhausted is what the grandmother of the main of Tabitha. Tabitha is the main character. Her grandmother's name is also Tabitha. So some of the people call little little Tabitha Tabitha too T W O like she's the second one. Tabitha's grandmother is a white lady, and she says to Tabitha, "Black girls must die exhausted," <laughs> in the sense that Tabitha's grandmother, when she was younger, was fascinated with the not fascinated that's the wrong word that's the wrong word she wasn't fascinated with the black people i'm still having some residuals for from such such a fun age she wasn't fascinated she had a black female neighbor that she loved it was the smartest girl in their school i think she the black girl did graduate valedictorian but because she was black and she lived in a segregated state she was not able to go to school in state so she had to figure out a way to go to college out of state even though she was a valedictorian and while the grandmother is telling tabby this story she says to herself you know black girls must die exhausted like having to navigate through this world where they're just as smart just as able just as capable but just based on their skin and as this book goes through their hair uh, just must be exhausted just to exist um this book starts off talking about i, I just want to tell you that part because that's how the this what the synopsis says on the back of the book and when you read about this book online that's one of the things it says that's how the title was created this book starts off with Tabitha 2, Tabby 2, going to the doctor. Her doctor telling her that she has, her eggs are dwindling normal than fast. Normal than, than someone her age should be losing their eggs. And it's really important to Tabitha that she has children. But at the rate she's going, she's not going to be able to because her eggs are dwindling. So she has a very short amount of time to make a decision up to where she wants to um, do with her eggs whether she's going to freeze them or try in vitro what she's going to do she's in a relationship with the guy but they've been dating each other for a long time and he ain't really making no moves where they can you know talk about having a life together so she's thinking about all of this and she's very upset and she's nervous and she's afraid and she is on her way to work and she's pulled over the, by the police and she panics because she lives in LA and she knows how things can turn really quickly and she panics. So she's put up the police and she begins to hyperventilate. She's scared and all these dead black people's names start kind of flashing through her. Like Tamir Rice is someone that's brought up in this book. Um, Sandra Bland is brought up in this book. And so she's terrified that the police pulls her over. Well, the police get to her car and he notices that she's terrified. So he ends up making her get out of the car. And he says, I can't believe it's come to this. And he said to her, my grandfather and my father were police officers. That's why I'm a police officer. For no other reason other than to honor the city that I live in. To honor people. You know, you don't have to be afraid. And she was like, the fuck I don't have to be afraid. And so they have a very interesting encounter. So she's actually a news reporter. And she brings that up to him. Pretty much just trying to say anything to say. 
I'm worth something. Someone loves me. Someone's going to be looking for me because she doesn't know what he has. Of course, he ends up letting her go because he said you were driving reckless because she was. She was upset and she had dropped her lipstick. She had been crying. So she was trying to get herself together because she only had a few minutes to get to work before she would miss the staff meeting. So this book just goes through her infertility, her boyfriend not want to commit, um, her been saving for a house she's probably gonna have to use that for her fertility journey it goes through her parents her grandmother is now in this kind of like nursing home facility kind of place but they do have some freedoms and her girlfriends are having a hard time and she's trying to get a promotion but this white guy that works for her is just beating her down every chance to get well it really just turns out he's jealous of her he's not jealous of her but he knows she's capable he knows she's capable, but she doesn't know she's capable. And all these things that she goes through, but then there's the added pressure of being black into it. Because when I'm reading books like this, I'm like, well, white people go through this too. And that's true. But then there's an added fight because for some reason, and now I got to prove something because... She's black and she has these really interesting encounters with her, her, the director of the news station. And then she has the, you, it's, uh, y'all, everything is just amplified and she's just trying to make it and everything is just amplified based on her skin. It's just, she's just trying to make it and she's just trying to make it and she's just trying to make it. This was a great read. This was a great read. I enjoyed this book helped me create a reading routine because I didn't have a, have a reading routine. But this book helped me create a reading routine because I wanted peace and time and coffee when I was reading <laughs> this book. And I absolutely love this book so much. And so this was the first book. The second book and Baby Makes Two means that you find out that you, I'm just going to spoil alert. She gets pregnant. <laughs> so she goes through all of her um, IV stuff, IVF, um, and um, she she ends up pregnant. And now she's a newscaster that she got the promotion over the white guy. She's proven herself. In the first book, she even creates, um, she finds the truth behind a story that was just a little simple one-line story that was barely in the news of a cop an off-duty cop who actually did shoot a black boy pretty much without asking any questions not knowing and the black boy was like yo i belong here this is my grandmother's house let me call my mom and she'll explain it so he goes to pull his phone out of the out of his pocket and the cop shoots him so this is an off do so that happens in this book so it, because based on that story she ends up winning an emmy so the news director definitely made the right decision she was the right person for the job and now she's has the pressure of being pregnant um things going on with her grandma um things going on with her dad she has two small um half sisters things are going on with her sisters things are going on with her best friends so all these things are going on and her news director calls her in and tells her that the people calling into the news station are complaining because she has started wearing her natural hair <laughs> and she like the fuck? what it's like she cannot she cannot just, just, she just can't get a break. Like everything, why, what, what? <laughs> so she can't get a break. So in the first book, she learns how to kind of relax and realize that not every white person is out to get her and not every uh, body wants her to do everything. And she kind of learns how to, make allies and make friends and not just the friends she has but actually make friends where she works in the actual news station because you know her girlfriends on the outside got her back she know her grandmama got her back she know her dad has her back 
And just the things she has to go through <laughs> with the baby. These two books are really good. They're really, really good. And what I'm most excited about about these books is that there is a third book in this series. It's not out yet. It's called Mark Your Words. Mark your words. Mark my words. <laughs> Mark my words. And I am just really, really excited to read that book next to close out this series. This is a great, great great series it wasn't as good as such a fun age but what is what is better than such a fun age i don't know nothing it's everything that i listened to or read this month this is a long video Ooh, i hope y'all make it through it <laughs> but anyway if you do i appreciate you and for sure give me a thumbs up my goodness you made it through all of this thank you so so much <laughs> and i'll see you in the next video bye beautiful